I've always had an innate desire to seek truth. Albert Einstein, with the theory of relativity, wanted to know what was really going on in the world. I realized that I had been perceiving the world upside down. When I was 11 years old, my mother contracted brain cancer. They had cut open her skull and, and she, she died from that shortly thereafter. And I remember at the funeral, the rabbi was Rabbi Binstock, big prominent rabbi, and in his eulogy he said, people generally are allotted their three score and 10, but in Lolita's case, who was my mother, she was just so blessed because she could be in heaven being young forever. And I remember the minion afterward, because that didn't sit well with me, going to the rabbi and saying, Rabbi, when my mother died, she had a shaved head and it was cut open. Will God take her back a year earlier when she was beautiful? And if he does that, why can't he take old people and have them go back several decades to be young and beautiful the same way? The rabbi had great consternation and looked at me like, said to my grandfather, Reuben, how could you raise such a grandson as this? He must leave this minion at once. And that was really my, my first association with looking to Judaism for the answers to my questions. I wasn't gonna get the truth from my Jewish upbringing. I just couldn't get the answers. So what I did is I said, I'm gonna take this upon myself. I wound up being admitted into Harvard Law School. And I remember the first day I went there, going under the portals of the Harvard Yard with the, with the emblem and the motto above and the wrought iron that said Veritas, and the meaning Latin for truth. And I thought this was gonna be the real place where I was going to finally accomplish my quest for truth. The law was very relative and provincial so when I went into practice, I took matters into my own hands. I would be omniscient. I was going to write documents that could foresee every contingency, and clients flocked to me. I was known as the lawyer that could solve problems other people can't, couldn't solve. I was just so proud with what I was accomplishing, and I really didn't look at what was happening with the rest of my life, the things that, if you will, didn't count on my grades. My marriage was falling apart. I had a son who I wasn't going to have custody with. My father was dying, and nothing really reverberated inside me because I was so imbued with my legal documents. And then on top of everything else, once the economy changed in the late 80s, people were challenging the things that I had written, these sacred documents. So really my world was coming down in a way that once again, I had another endeavor where truth was not being achieved. And in the midst of all that, I became serious with a beautiful woman named Susan. There was something different about her. She had a tremendous caring and kindness to me and my son in a way that was soothing and was an unguent to how frayed I was feeling at that time. So when she broached with me that we should go to a church to a Passover dinner that was conducted by a Jewish follower of Jesus Christ, which made no sense to me, she had to take me kicking and screaming. But when I went, he spoke about the connection between the bondage of the slaves in Egypt and Jesus is talking about the bondage and the slavery imposed by sin. I felt like Helen Keller at the well when she felt like the water, the water, and started saying the words in her hands. Every page of that Bible talks to you about the limits of the law and that the documents, if your heart is not in it, aren't worth the paper that they're written on. To think that something such as himself, perfect, would die so that I could get the rewards 
as if I had met the law when I hadn't, was something that was in, incredibly meaningful for me. It turned out that in retrospect, I was as dumb as all those Jews I had criticized in Hebrew school. I was 11 days away from the promised land, but I had to, in my own way, in real time, spend 40 years in the wilderness. In 1998, when I married my new wife, Susan, and we were about to have our child, it turned out that he was going to have Down syndrome. I'd had a tough enough life as it was with my mother dying early and the things that I'd been up against and they were working out right now. I didn't need that kind of service the rest of my life and I just didn't want to have it. My faith got tied up with Abraham to think that he would be willing to show his faith in God to kill his son and what a wimp I would be that I couldn't show my faith in God to do the natural act of letting my son live. We named him Matthew, which means gift of God. And Susan and I had no idea how poignant that would be. All the kinds of things that I was just so full of and correlated with merit just went out the window with Matthew. When he puts up his hands and communes with God, it's a whole closeness that people such as myself around him can only aspire to.